Okay, so we're here with a very, very special guest today on Mason's Medicinals, part of the Real Mushrooms Practitioner Interviews. And Dr. Rob Hoffman is a doctor of Chinese medicine, and he's currently the dean of doctoral studies at Yosan University in LA. He has extensive experience, not only in the academic sense, but also the practical sense, which I'm really looking forward to chatting with you today, Rob. Thanks, thanks. For, thanks for being here. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, we've connected a few times on the Real Mushroom chats and on the Facebook, so it's nice to kind of connect face-to-face and really, yeah, have some connection in this Zoom era. Yeah, it's a, a difficult time to be uh, a human being, I think. I think we're all feeling that. I think we're all sort of realizing our pack mentality a bit more each day. Definitely. Loss of connection. Yeah. So why don't you introduce yourself first from a personal perspective and kind of diving into why you got into Chinese medicine and why you sort of gravitated towards this field of study, because it's... Um, it's a unique study and you, you take quite a personalized approach to it, I feel. So why don't you start there? Sure. It, it's a little, it kind of goes in circles a little bit. Um, I like, I think most uh, American boys growing up in the seventies and eighties, you know, was attracted to Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris films and Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um, so I did martial arts. I did karate uh, growing up and then I, uh, I, I grew up in New Jersey, you know, in, in fairly small towns. There was, there was certainly very little to almost no exposure of anything about Chinese medicine. Um, you know, no real idea of say, like, oh, what we'll call alternative health care. You know, everything was fairly mainstream. So even though I was really serious into martial arts and began meditating, there was kind of no outlet for it like my parents didn't know how to help um and as i moved like into college i was kind of like well what do i do with my life what do i do with my career um i was the first one in my family to go to college so there was no like you know there wasn't a lot of like guidance it was kind of like get a job be a lawyer a doctor like find something you know that you can make a living at um so i i kind of pushed away martial arts and any kind of spiritual non-judeo-christian ideas because i didn't know what to do with them um and i actually went into the music business which was totally different than what my parents envisioned and i did that for like a decade um and after about 10 years of torturing myself and doing like 120 hour weeks i was not a healthy person i was you know mentally in bad shape i was waking up every day and hitting Advil and a a raspberry Snapple and a chocolate muffin and going on with my day. Um, I lived on these vitamins. I I don't remember the name, but they were crazy. They were bee pollen and ginseng. (laughs) That's what would keep me awake. Um, So yeah, you can imagine the, the picture of that basically. And so coming around 1998-ish, 1999, um, I, I started to get back into martial arts. I, I needed you know, I needed an outlet. I needed to get healthier. I was beginning to feel weird. Like I was having just weird illnesses. I had pleurisy, which is like, you know, for a 29 year old guy who doesn't smoke and doesn't do drugs and, and, you know, has lived, you know, in a normal, healthy environment, that's not a normal uh, disorder to have. So I got back into martial arts and one of the things that that pushed me into Chinese martial arts is when I had been younger, when I was 18, I was really into karate. And but I noticed like a lot of the, the Japanese masters, like by the time they were in their 50s and 60s, they had arthritis, they were dying young. And I was looking at Chinese martial artists like Tai Chi and Xing Yi and Bagua, and I'm like, those guys seem to live a lot longer. Like, maybe I'll do that. Um, and I know that's that's a huge generalization. And there's always somebody there's like, no, but this guy lived to be 105. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it. But in general, in my experience, that was the observation. So I moved into Chinese martial arts, um, Xing Yi, Tai Chi, Bagua, um, and Hungar. Um, so internal and external arts. And like over the course of that time, I was still working in the music industry. 
and I was working with different Qigong teachers and they were all taking Chinese herbs. And I was like, what are you, what are you taking? What do you got going on? Like, what, what is this stuff? And they were taking reishi mushroom. They were taking hushu, um, various forms of ginseng. So I started to kind of experiment with that. Um, I got my first acupuncture treatment probably in about 2002, 2003, sometime in there. And it kind of sparked that old wonder, you know, that I, that I'd had as a teenager. It was like, Oh, there's like, there's a whole other thing. And of course, um, I very rarely do anything kind of, uh, halfway. I'm a, I'm an all in kind of guy. So I started talking to my, my wife, who's, who's now my ex. I'm like, you know, I think like, I think I want to investigate Chinese medicine. Maybe we should, maybe I should do that. And she's like, what do you mean? You have a whole career in the music business. And I'm like, I know, but this thing over here is really cool and it makes me feel good and I'll be healthier. So by um, kind of between 2004, 2006, I had in my brain that something had to shift and I had to possibly change careers. And simultaneously in the music business, you know, that's when like Napster and downloads and streaming and all of that stuff was birthing. And I could see the writing on the wall. I'm like, my, the life that I have as a music, musician now is not going to exist in 10 years. So um, there were a couple events in my life that were like really clear that like, I, I wanted to help people. I wanted to go into medicine. I wanted to go into some kind of healing modality. Um, I guess I can talk, talk about that if you, um, so I went to Sri Lanka after the tsunami um, to do aid work. My Tai Chi teacher's wife was Sri Lankan, so we had really good connections down there. Um, and I hadn't, I had traveled, you know, to again, East Coast American guy. I'd been to Puerto Rico, I'd been to the Bahamas, um, I'd been to Europe a few times, but I'd never been anywhere like Sri Lanka. I'd never been to a developing nation. Um, I'd certainly never been to a disaster area. Um, and that trip, uh, we were, I was down there about six months after the tsunami. We stayed for three weeks and it was like life changing. Um, and I knew getting on the plane to come home, I was like, there's no way I can go back to my normal life. There's no way having seen what I just saw that I can do the things that I do. And, uh, you know, I had long talks with my, with my ex about it. And it took a, a lot of unraveling. Um, and then I took my first trip to China in 2006. Um, I went with a Qigong teacher and we visited many Taoist mountains and that like solidified it. By the time I left there, I was like, I'm going to Chinese medicine school. I'm gonna become you know, a Chinese medicine doctor. I wanna work with herbs. I wanna do acupuncture. Um, and that then set off like a four year period of turmoil of re, organizing my life. I ended up getting divorced and then started Chinese medicine school in 2010. And that set this whole thing in motion, basically. So that's the, that's the quick story. That's, that's super special. I really <laughs> people like you that kind of do that 180 and really follow what they're feeling at the point. So yeah, I really just admire folks like you that do that. And yeah, it sounds like you're quite a creative guy, you know, with your, your music and your, obviously attracted to more of the martial arts that are more, you know, movement based, but I don't know, is there an element of that creativity that comes through the, the martial arts that you use? Oh, definitely. I, I think, um, I think once you have a, the foundation and it's the same thing in Chinese medicine and even in research, believe it or not, like once the foundation is set, right, that's when creativity can be birthed. Um, and it's the same thing in music. There, there are people that pick up a guitar the first time and write a song or somebody sits at a piano and they just something, maybe it's their uh, karmic connection or rebirth or something and they can just play. But for most of us, it requires, you know, years of study and building a foundation before creativity, you know, can really open up. So I find the same thing um, in martial arts, especially like once the foundation is there, creativity can really um, can really open up and, and expose you to new things and ignite that, uh, that spark that can help create, you know, a whole new world, a whole new martial art form, a whole new method of healing, whatever it is. Um, for me, it's always about foundation. 
love to chat more about martial arts, maybe on another chat. And yeah. you know that I feel like that could unlock a whole new conversation. But yeah, hopefully yeah, for sure. on that later. So that's how you got interested. That's that's very unique. I like your I like your intro into the herbal medicine, Chinese medicine, martial art world. What about academically? I know you're quite the academic and you're also studying or getting your, I think right now in the midst of getting your PhD, do you want to talk, chat yeah. more about your academics? Yeah. So the, well, the interesting thing is it was the trips to China that got me into Reishi. Um, I was going to do, I was, I was taking a trip to China. I was going to be in the Zhongnang mountains, which has a history of Taoist hermits. Um, and I was actually going to stay in a, a temple, a cave, carved in, into the side of a mountain for a few hundred years ago for the purpose of Taoist meditation. And I was telling an acupuncturist that I knew about this trip. And she said, oh, you have to take reishi mushroom with you. And I was like, well, what's going to happen? Like, what? that sounds cool. What do I do? And she's like, I'll get you the formula. So she, she gave me a formula that was... Um, if I remember all the herbs, it was reishi mushroom, gochitsa, which is goji berry, uwitsa, which is shisandra berry, reishi goji uwitsa, um, oh, and, and uh, maimendong, which is uh, ophiopogon. Um, so a very nourishing formula. And uh, so I took that the entire time I was in the cave. I fasted. I just had water and this, this formula. Um, and I had crazy dreams. I, you know, I don't often talk about that experience, but it was really like, whoa, this is a heavy, like, you know, kind of transcendental experience. Um, so that, that was the beginning of Reishi. Um, but then a few years later, I start Chinese medicine school because of course, in this country, like if you want to practice with herbs, like that's a, a licensed accredited kind of, kind of route to do that. And it aligned with everything else I was doing in my life. Um, so I go to Chinese medicine school, you know, that's a four year, four and a half year program. I got my master's and I knew starting that I would do the doctorate. I knew I was going to go straight through to what's called the DAOM degree, the kind of the terminal degree. Um, because again, I don't do it halfway. I'm like, all right, I need to see everything. I need to do the entire program. Um, and then I, I chose the program I chose because they also had relationships with schools in China. So that got me both the excuse and the desire to keep going back to China more often. Um, so I've been enrolled in uh, Zhejiang Chinese Medical University. Uh, I'm going into my fourth year now. It's a PhD program. Um, my PhD will be in, in pharmacology. And the primary thing that I do is I look at how Chinese herbs can uh, be utilized in cancer therapy. So we look at uh, the effects on the immune system, regulation of T cells, cytokines, um, even how Chinese herbs affect chemotherapy, radiation therapy, both uh, as an adjuvant therapy or you know after um, to alleviate side effects. So Hopefully, I'll be done this year. I hope. I think. I wish you the whole time. I can, thank you. If I can keep writing, if I can write fast enough, I'll be done soon. Maybe more reishi or. Yeah, <laughs> that's super, that's super interesting that you, you know, you've been practicing. How long have you been practicing, actually? Uh, I graduated from Chinese medicine school only in 2015. I'm, I'm just a baby at all of this. It's all, um, but I, I'm definitely one who's on an accelerated path. It was the same thing in music. Um, same thing, like with my surfing, same thing with martial arts. Like, I usually dive so blindly and wholeheartedly into something I do that I, I tend to outpace, you know, people who started at the same time with me. It's, it's not because I'm necessarily good at it. Um, I think Einstein said something like that, right? Like, I'm not actually very good at this. I'm just in, um, I'm just incessantly curious or something like that. Like, I can't sleep. I'm so like, oh, I need to know more of this. Well, that sounds like a really good energy to have. Yeah, all your interests. It's a little exhausting as I get older, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I can feel similar for sure with getting really yeah. in something and jumping in. So you know, relate. So when you're in China, I know a lot of people that are wondering about medicinal mushrooms, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. They always question 
they don't always, but some people question the quality and some people are worried about a product that may come from China. Do you want to touch a little bit on that aspect on your experience from actually being in China and perhaps being in some of the provinces or areas where these medicinal mushrooms are grown and used quite extensively? Yeah, actually, um, it, it really stems back to um, my, mar my first Qigong martial arts trip. Like I had been studying, again, martial arts since my teens. And then when I came back into it in my 20s, you know, a lot of people were saying like, you know, China's very closed down. There's no more Kung Fu masters there. There's no good martial arts, all of that. And somebody says that to me, no matter what it is, I'm like, well, I'm going to have to go experience that for myself. So China's a difficult place. You know, the doors don't always open. I, I always use the analogy, like imagine visiting someone's grandma who makes these amazing chocolate chip cookies and she just met you. She might give you the recipe, but she might not, right? You know, China is very much that kind of thing. Like, are you just another guy from America who's going to visit us once and take our secrets back to America and make a billion dollars? Or are you really into this and you want to come back again and again? So I went to China the first time, 2006, and I found like really amazing, like great Taoist monks, you know, who were willing to talk about meditation and Neigong. Um, I, I met Qigong teachers who were willing to teach their form because I had the right introductions. And every trip I took to China, the doors would open, you know, and they just kept opening for me because of the relationships that I was cultivating. Um, so that led to, I actually investigated going to Chinese medicine school in China for a minute, but the, it was like a 12 year extravaganza, um, which I'll end up doing here anyway, but I'll be home. I won't be in China. Um, so in all of my travels, I would begin to visit Chinese medicine schools, Chinese medicine practitioners, um, herbal markets, wherever I go in China, I try to find if there's a local herbal market and visit people. Um, and what I discover, of course, uh, is, is should be obvious to all of us is China is huge. Right. And there's a saying that even if you visit Shanghai, Hong Kong, Beijing, you still haven't seen China. And it's absolutely true because every city, every region, every county, every province is so vastly different. Right. That there's there, it would it's absolutely impossible to make a generalization, um, just like America. Like if you've flown into, say, Newark, New Jersey, we'll use my home state. Right. If you flew into Newark, New Jersey, you would say, oh my God, New Jersey is the most polluted place on the planet, right? But you drive an hour outside from the airport and suddenly you're in farm country. Like where I grew up, um, like there's all these like little micro farms all over the place with horses and tomatoes and corn. And New Jersey is actually famous for its tomatoes. Um, but if you ask the average person in America about New Jersey, they think of Newark, New Jersey and Elizabeth Port and all that. And China is the exact same way. If you ask the average person about China, they'll say it's polluted. It's, uh, you know, you can't trust anything coming out of there. And when you visit China and you get on a bus, which is the, one of the best ways or now the bullet trains to see the country, you realize how vast it is. And when you get into these growing regions, especially, right? There, many of them are, are highly protected. Um, they, the Chinese government has certainly realized that Chinese herbs are a commodity. They need to be protected. Um, there's testing. You guys know you, you can import something here without testing, right? The FDA can show up at your door and say, what do you got? Let me see your tests, right? They can halt stuff at the border, right? It can get stuck at the docks. So um, i I feel just immensely confident um, having worked in Chinese hospitals, having worked in Chinese herbal clinics. Um, I see the level of care, the level of quality. Um, that's not to say, as we've seen, that there aren't adulterated products, but much of that are, those products are often not things that we're gonna buy, right? Those are things that you would find in little Chinese grocery stores, you know, maybe some Chinese pharmacies, but when we're dealing you know, with American manufacturers who are sourcing in China, there are so many levels of testing along the way, verification, all of that, that I'm, 
I, I honestly, I never gave it a second thought. It never crosses my mind. I do my, I do my due diligence. I go on the website or I make the phone call. I find out about their testing heavy metals and pesticides. And for me, of course, is the source is perhaps the most important thing to me. Um, you know, was it grown in the right growing region? Was it harvested at the right time of the year? Um, obviously, is it the right species? Like all of these things play into how I choose my herbs because I'm giving them to patients. I'm giving them to patients with cancer and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Like I'm not just going onto Amazon and saying like, oh, this looks like the right herb. Let me grab that. It's There's a whole process there. Um, and on, honestly, like not not to go into the commercial mode, but that's why I choose real mushrooms. Like, you know, that's one of the reasons, like there are so many companies that are importing, but when a company gives me all the information, right, and can show me the testing, like that's who I'm gonna use every time. So, like I said, I've never, I never give it, give it a second thought if somebody's willing to open up, uh, you know, kind of the window of how they source and how they test. Yeah, that's, I really liked your points on how, you know, China's huge, just like, North America, like you said, and there's so many generalizations that can happen. And again, yeah, the checkpoints. There's so many checkpoints when looking at yeah. you know, a regulated product. I, I appreciated your answer regarding the yeah, just that whole scenario involving checkpoints and the generalizations that are often made. So I appreciate you just touching on that. I want to learn more about, and I think some of our viewers are interested in your your research and especially your thoughts around, you know, the immune system, T cells, using different medicinal mushrooms to affect immune response in relation to cancer or whatever you want to talk about. But I think you'll probably touch on that a bit. But I guess what what is the the main takeaways that you've come across through your research and practical application of medicinal mushrooms and the immune system? The main takeaways, <laughs> there's so many. No, I would say, you know, <laughs> I come at all of this, you know, from a Chinese medicine background. I come at it through a foundation, you know, which you've heard Michael Max and I talk about that. Um, you know, often when you go on, say, medicinal herbal uh, forums or, or media groups and things like that, there's always a question of like, which mushroom's good for this? Which mushroom's good for that? And for Chinese medicine practitioners, that's really hard to kind of parse because you're like, wait, there's a whole, there's a whole like structure that this all has to fit in. Like there's no one herb that's like an herb that's good for your migraine is not good for migraine, my migraine, right? It, it, there's a whole structure that has to go around it. So what, I, what I've learned in China, um, you know, I'm, at this stage, I'm going back prior to COVID, I was going twice a year, um, waiting for my next trip. Um, but what I've learned in, in seeing patients there and in working in uh, specifically clinics that treat cancer, um, all of my mentors are writing formulas based on the, the foundations of Chinese medicine pattern, pattern differentiation or pattern diagnosis, right? You know, we can't go into all of that, but you know, does this person have a cold pattern or a hot pattern? Is it phlegm? You know, is it dampness? Is it dampness with heat? There's a whole system, right, to figuring out how we're going to write a formula. And rarely do we give, you know, one herb or one mushroom or one of anything. It's it's usually in the in the um, it's usually wrapped up in a whole formula that, that helps both the symptomology of the patient, it helps guide the herbs where they need to be to the specific region. Um, so when I'm prescribing mushrooms, I'm still always following that blueprint, right? What's their pattern? How do I differentiate? And then I'm using the, the mushroom, right? Based on the same, what we call the tropisms, right? Like the, based on the same tropisms within Chinese medicine and even herbs that are not Chinese in nature, which are not part of the pharmacopoeia, through modern research, um, we are still able to determine like their, what would be their Chinese medicine qualities. And what's cool is the research actually often um, confirms the Chinese concept of where the herb goes. So like chaga is a great example, right? It's, it's not a Chinese herbal mushroom. Um, I think you guys have a blog on it. I talk about it all the time. Like people say it's in Shen Nong's Ben Sao Jing, the oldest herbal medical text in China. And it's like, 
No, it's not. <laughs> it's not there at all. Um, it comes from Siberia and there's the tribe. Like it's a whole other thing. And that's fine. But it is, you know, now used in China and can be used obviously within the parameters of Chinese medicine. Um, and the cool thing is we can look at how chaga was used in digestive orders, disorders, right? We can look at how it was used to clear skin disorders. Um, you know, in its in its Aboriginal use or its original uses, you know, it's used as a wash to clear off infections. They actually wash newborn babies in it to re, to make sure there are no pathogens, you know, skin pathogens. So you start to like look at those examples and you say, ah, it's good for digestive disorder. So in Chinese medicine, that puts it in the large intestine, stomach, and spleen, organ systems, and and possibly channels. Um, it's used on the skin. So in Chinese medicine, that might be related to the lung. So we begin to develop a framework, right, around how that herb might be used in Chinese medicine and then how it could be used, um, you know, within a Chinese medicine formula. And then when you go to the research, you see that, ah, chaga can actually regulate blood sugar. Right, that, that's a, there is a research study for that. So that's related to that liver pancreas axis. Um, chaga, again, can help um, reduce inflammation in the gut. So it confirms that idea of like a large intestine, stomach, spleen connection. So many times it's, it's since my thing is mostly mushrooms, but it, shows, it bears out in other Chinese herbs where the research confirms the kind of ancient idea of where that, what organ that herb targeted. And that to me is the coolest thing. You know, reishi um, going to the liver, spleen and lung, uh, sorry, liver, liver, lung and heart. You know, often we see uh, reishi can't be given with someone who's on blood thinners, right? It's, it's contraindicated in that case. So it has something to do with circulation. So it confirms its ability to move blood and affect the heart in Chinese medicine. So, um, that to me is the coolest thing when the ancient and the research kind of come together. Yeah, that's super cool. Uh, I always like asking people involved in Chinese medicine who study Chinese medicine uh, this for that question because I never get the the straightforward answer, which is where the beauty of it all lies. So I <laughs> the philosophy and the the real holistic thinking that goes into Chinese medicine because it it just expresses how, how deep and how insightful the, the knowledge really is. So. Yeah. And we've only got like, you know, realistically like 99% of the, the texts on Chinese medicine have never been translated. So <laughs> we're operating, you know, for the, from the English language, we're indebted to our translators and we're operating on such a small kernel of the knowledge available to us. So that that's that's what keeps me going back to China and studying Chinese language and studying Taoism to really try to get to the heart of it. I don't know if I'll accomplish it in this lifetime, but at least that's the goal. Yeah, maybe you will. I, you know, you, <laughs> I don't know. I hit 51 in a couple of weeks. So I'm <laughs> beginning to question my, my abilities. <laughs> what I ask about that is from a Chinese medicine perspective or your perspective is there mm -hmm. common tropisms or patterns that show up in the oncology world in a chinese medicine viewpoint like are they usually deficient people are they usually yeah, yeah. I guess, is there any common patterns that come up in that chinese view of oncology that's a great that's a great question um and it actually goes back, that's, that's like the opening paragraph of my dissertation right now, <laughs> the opening introduction. So Chinese medicine um, really began to identify what we term as cancer, like all the way back to the Shang dynasty, like 3000 years ago. Um, of course, it wasn't called cancer. They had various terms for lumps or tumors, liu, um, or they would also call it, by the time the Nanjing comes around, they call them accumulations. So they saw lumps and tumors um, as, uh, you know, a stagnant pool of like phlegm um, and tumors are considered phlegm in Chinese medicine. So um, there is something, there, there's this mechanism called qi hua or qi transformation. And that, that mechanism of transformation is, is halted or stunted in some way, shape or form. Um, 
the Huangdi Ni Jing, which is our primary medical text that most things are born from, uh, very much talks about environment, emotions, and diet leading to these accumulations. So they were hip to cancer, you know, before we were even contemplating what it could be. Um, and they were even doing like Huato's of a famous Chinese uh, medicine practitioner. Um, and he was actually doing abdominal surgery on abdominal masses, you know, 800 years ago or something. So yeah, think about that. Um, so it, it really came down to those masses and accumulations and then coming back to the pattern, like what caused that accumulation? Was it an emotional thing? You know, was it a dietary thing? Was it environmental? And, you know, we, again, we see that in modern research. Often women who have breast cancer have suffered, um, you know, a great deal of depression, right? We find that prior to their diagnosis of breast cancer, there is some level of depression in their history. Um, you know, we can obviously look to, uh, you know, liver cancers, you know, are often dietary, dietarily related, you know, or often related to hep C. Um, so there are these, these factors that Western medicine was much slower to recognize. Um, and the Chinese had them 2000 years ago, at least. Um, but there's no, of course, there's no, there's no one cause there's no one person there's no one phenotype there's no one body shape or anything like that but it definitely comes down to that original text that says environment emotions diet your lifestyle that's what that's what brings this on awesome thanks for clearing that up going into that yeah. just a little bit deeper do you want to talk about turkey tail now sure is, a good time sure. Turkey tail? is there any yeah i love turkey tail why don't you tell me about the study you're telling me about the other day on the turkey tail and the blood moving salvia species. Remember us talking about that? Should I tell you how I got to turkey tail? <laughs> it's yeah, kind of a funny story. So uh, I went to, to my research advisor in China and I was like, reishi, 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 I got to do reishi, you know, because that's, that's the herb I ate in the cave and da 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 da. And she's like, yeah, reishi's been done. I think you should do something else. And I was like, <gasps> You know, she kind of pulled the, the rug out from under me. And then I came home and uh, a friend asked about my reishi research. And I was like, eh, I'm not really sure I'm going to do it. So here's all my research. And then they went out and wrote their capstone on reishi. So I was like, my American capstone and my Chinese dissertation were like, Ugh, reishi. so reishi got squandered. And I was like, what am I going to do? And I read a study on turkey tail. And I was like, ah, that's, that's where I'm headed. So turkey tail became the main um, kind of the main herb that I've been researching. And it's interesting in that it, it kind of follows a lot of the same, um, some of the same tropisms as reishi, right? They, they overlap um, in their, their organ destinations. They overlap in their ability to say um, ameliorate cough. Um, reishi has more of the ability to calm shen or calm the emotions in turkey tail, but it's still present in turkey tail. Um, but the studies on, on turkey tail are, are really interesting, uh, first of all, because in all of the studies, there are virtually no bad side effects, right? Even in reishi, I, I would recommend it to almost anybody. There's, there's still a couple of negatives, you know, there's, like I said, contraindications with anybody who's on blood thinners, things like that. Um, turkey tail, the classic contra, uh, the, the classic side effects are that your nail bed might get a little darker. Like that's it, um, and this and the studies, the research studies bear that out as well. They, there's almost um, let's knock on all kinds of wood right now. You know, there's there's almost no side effects to taking it. Um, so my my I would say my favorite turkey tail study, which we we didn't get to talk about the other day, but my favorite one is a study. Um, I believe it's Donatini, uh, and they took. Uh, 70, it's a small study. They took like 75 patients and, that they had done oral swabs and they found HPV 16 and 18. Um, they divided that. They had three groups, obviously control. They gave one group uh, Ganoderma. They gave one group reishi. They gave the other group a mixture of reishi and turkey tail. And um, 
14 weeks, maybe 14 weeks to form 14 to 16 weeks. Um, they, they retest everybody. The, obviously the control group had whatever normal populations have for HPV group. The Ganoderma group had about 5% clearance. The group with Ganoderma and Coriolis, turkey tail and reishi had an 88% clearance of HPV 16 and 18. And that's really important because those are the primary HPVs that cause cancer. So within four months of a standard oral solution, this is not an injection, this is not a rat study, um, it's not uh, in vitro, we see this clearance of HPV 16 and 18. Like that, I read that study and I'm like, I'm in turkey tail, here we go. Um, the other ones that, that come up often, and this is really uh, cool with COVID right now, um, I've been talking kind of informally with a research group that's running a research trial, um, and they had, I had sent them my, um, my American doctoral program. I had sent them my capstone because it was all on turkey tail. Um, this Yunjur Danshen, which is uh, turkey tail mushroom and salvia, and it's been really effective in post breast cancer treatment to ameliorate the side effects of breast cancer. Um, we find higher quality of life scores, less pain, um, reduced uh, leukopenia and, and thrombocytopenia, so uh, less incidence of um, various anemias that are the result of cancer and radiation. Um, and one of the, I think the most, a, the, probably the most pertinent part of turkey tail right now is it helps the immune system recognize pathogens from outside the body. So it improves the IgM response. Um, so when you think of turkey tail as a potential for COVID treatment, right, it could also be a potential for, um, you know, potentially, you know, COVID uh, prevention, um, you know, it's at least reducing the possibility um, or possibly reducing symptoms uh, of an infection. So, you know, it still has to be studied. This, this is, I'm looking at other studies and saying, could it be used here? And I think that's a real possibility. Um, and the Yunjur Danshan uh, decoction is really interesting because when you see the first studies that come out of China with COVID, um, the number one comorbidity was uh, heart issues. Right, and we see that now with heart, you know, uh, different heart inflammations, um, circulation problems. Um, so this idea of using the Yunjur Danshen, something that invigorates the blood and increases circulation with Yunjur that improves the immune system um, and also reduces inflammation in the body, regulates T cells, that, that's a potential like really potent um, herbal combination that could be layered on top of, you know, some of the other formulas that have come out. Um, Thomas Avery, Garen, and Shelley Ox uh, are two Chinese medicine practitioners that went through like the first, I think, six to eight months of Chinese medical studies and writings on COVID, and they translated all of them, and they've put out a free text. So you can kind of like look at all the Chinese research and then begin to look at the experiences in American clinics and amongst American Chinese practitioners, and you could begin to really develop um, some potential therapeutics based on Chinese herbs. It's uh, super fascinating, and it kind of ties into the well, sort of, but the you know the stagnation and the moving blood and moving qi that you're talking about earlier, in the sense of the oncology people. So, yeah, definitely some similar threads there. With yeah, for sure. Great. So talk a little bit about turkey tail. What about in your own life? Do you, do you use medicinal mushrooms? Do you use, use them for personal health, your family's health, or you kind of just use them every once in a while? What's, what's your personal? Constantly. <laughs> right now I'm actually trying your, your, the new, um, the mushroom D2, D2Z. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm trying that. I'm, I'm checking it out. Um, 
I'm often just an experiment. I'm a walking lab, basically. I'm like, oh, somebody's got this formula. Let me try that for a while and see what happens. Um, and if I get diarrhea, I've not, I know I'm on the wrong formula. Um, so I, I do do a lot of that. Um, before I give my patients a formula, I will try it, um, even if it has nothing to do with me. So I know that's a it's a terrible thing to do and not really smart, but I do do that stuff a lot. So um, I've been trying the mushroom D2. Um, depending on what's going on, you know, on, on top of that, I will do my own pattern differentiation and take formulas and herbs based on that. Um, so right now, um, I'll be like candidly honest, uh, lots of stress, some dietary issues, um, Difficult concentrating just because of everything that's going on. So I'm taking a formula called Shaoyasan, free and easy wander. Um, so that that's my that's like my base formula. On top of that, I'm taking the mushroom D2. Um, and then in, in my office at the school, I have um, basically every mushroom known to man in tincture and capsule. So depending on what's going on that day, I'll kind of do my own little decoction, like if I'm feeling really low, feeling kind of tired, you know, it might be reishi and cordyceps. Um, if uh, I'm kind of having a weird digestive day, it may just be chaga, um, you know, and that that's on top of what I would take like morning and night. So it's a, it's a little bit of a walking lab experiment. And then for my patients, um, I don't seek out like looking for a way to give them mushrooms, but if it's appropriate, of, of course I add it on. And again, it's always part of a Chinese formula. So, but often what that is, because most patients aren't gonna cook raw herbs, I'm usually using a patented capsule of Chinese formula, and then I'll use a capsule of the specific mushroom. So there are times when I use the combination, something like five defenders, I'll use, um, less often than the individual mushrooms, but I, I will use it. Like if I have a patient that has had um, a lot of cancer in their family or they are in remission themselves, like five defenders is a perfect kind of like, here's your baby aspirin. You know, I know that's kind of frowned upon today, but basically here, here's your daily, you know, here's your daily supplement on top of whatever else I might prescribe for you. Um, but then if they've got, you know, a an actual say like disorder or dis-ease, you know, it'll be a, a very clear Chinese formula or a combination of Chinese formulas. And then there might be like reishi on top of that or turkey tail on top of that, things like that. Sounds like a, a good way to experiment. That's why I got my glass experimental thing in my logo because yeah, I think it's good to experiment and try things out obviously. For our patient. You have to. I mean, think about it. You can't like you don't gonna hand your patient uh, like, here, try this. <laughs> Let me know how it goes. Like, what? No way. Um, you know, and Li Shijian, who's like one of the most famous Chinese herbalists, he wrote the Ben Sao Gong Mu. He was some trying something like I don't know, a hundred herbs a day or something like that. Some kind of insane number, like. I did that in Chinese medicine school and I was usually sick after most herb classes. Um, Cause there's some, you know, there's some nasty stuff, but I just, I feel like if I'm gonna investigate a new formula and especially a new company, right? I wanna see like how it affects me and I can smell it. Like I can, you know, even with a capsule, you can, you can open it up, you know, you, you can smell if the herb is in there Right. And then you can open up the actual capsule and, and, and taste the powder and decide, like, especially if it's something, well, like cordyceps. I don't know if you like the taste of cordyceps. It destroys me. I'm ready to like, I mean, ugh, it's horrible. But, you know, when you're taking real cordyceps, because it, it has that flavor. Same thing with like, you know, if there's goji or shisandra in there, you, you taste even the, the powder and you know immediately like, yep. There it is. Ah, yeah, this one has, even though it's a powder, I can taste the eucomia. I can taste the shisandra. I taste the gochitsa. Oh, and there's that bile coming up. There's that, you know, coptis and scoot coming in the back end. Like you, it's all in there, but you got to do that or else your patients, I don't know. It just seems, it seems like the, something to do that 
increases your integrity, I think, for me. Yeah, I'd have to agree that whole uh, organoleptic evaluation of herbs and mushrooms is yeah. you know, such a good process to continue to do. Rob, do you have any, just being mindful of time here, but Rob, do you have any personal or, I guess, philosophies that you sort of recommend people use or follow in their life? Like I usually ask people like three things, you know, and everybody's going to be so different with the individual mm -hmm. and everything, but what do you think three things are that you try to implement with all your people or people you care about? <laughs> um, yeah, three things actually pretty, well, it might be four, but let's see, let's try. So <laughs> um, number one, is diet, right? Don't walk in the kitchen and say, ooh, what should I eat, right? Walk in the kitchen and say, what do I need, right? Changing that mindset. We've, we've forgotten how to eat. That's why diets are so popular. We just don't know how to eat. So it takes time to cultivate that idea, but, but simply walking into a grocery store or your kitchen and saying, what do I need? What is my body calling for? Am I just thirsty or am I going to buy a bag of Swedish fish? Cause I think I'm hungry, right? Like, well, like, what do you need? So beginning to look at your diet. Um, and along with that, of course, is like stopping all the fad diets. Like China, again, I come from a Chinese medicine approach, which is everything that's edible is on the table. Right, and I'm going to mix and match and find the right elements that that fit my body, that fit my constitution, that fit the season, that fit my geography, right, that fit my lineage, right. All of those things kind of come into play with our diet. So that that's like the first thing. Um, the second thing is sleep, and I'm the worst example of this in the world right now. But you must sleep. My sleep is so bad right now. Um, the the Taoist Chinese medicine gods are looking down on me like what do you think you're doing? Um, but, but sleep, it, it's of prime importance. You know, you can't escape this. Um, you've got to figure out how to sleep and when to sleep. And that includes turning off the TV, turning off the iPhone, the iPad, the, all the, all of that stuff. Um, and it's okay to wake up in the middle of the night. You know, there are more and more studies that are showing us that, that, that second sleep, you know, was a real thing. And lots of Taoist meditations, you know, have to occur between one and 3 a.m. And like, that stuff's real. Um, so I try to talk to my patients that have insomnia that wake up in the middle of the night is like, okay, can we reframe this, right? Can, can we look at it as a time of contemplation or a time of reading or study that allows you to get tired and go back to sleep? And if not, if that's not possible, well, th then let's look at formulas you know, to figure out what's going on in your head, what's going on in your heart and help you get back to sleep. Rest and sleep are just of prime importance. And we're so wrapped up in getting everything done, which is me right now, um, that we forget how important sleep really is. And you can see it in patients in their, their psycho-emotional disorders, right? You can see in two seconds when it's a sleep-derived disorder and then it's gotta be worked on and then it's gotta be fixed. So diet, sleep, um, and then for me, it's like, I, I would wrap a couple things into like your life practice, right? Are you chasing your dreams? Um, do you feel stunted? Are you able to move forward with your planning, um, and, and going after your dreams? And does that involve the, the other piece of that is, does it involve a life practice? Is it surfing, meditation, yoga, CrossFit, whatever your thing is, like you have to make time for that. And right now we have a three and a half year old and an eight month old. So my, <laughs> my life practice, my, the things that I enjoy are kind of getting pushed to the side. Um, but, you know, I, I keep them in my head as a priority and, and, and make sure I take time, you know, every week to do Tai Chi, to do, to meditate. I have a Taoist practice. I say, you know, Taoist uh, prayers every day. Um, you know, and guess what? Sometimes those are on the way driving to work. Sometimes they're in front of my altar and that's fine. That, that is what it is. We do everything we can. So those, those three things to me, that's it. Um, everything else will fall. If those three things are in alignment, the other things tend to fall into place. Pretty solid foundation. Thanks. Rob, is there anything else you wanted to touch on in the realm of medicinal mushrooms before we kind of 
transition here to end the call. I know that uh, you've got. Oh, you know, one of the one of the things that so going back to the practice and dealing with oncology and and cancer patients, but it, it comes up in all kinds of disease. And it's important to think about, you know, mushrooms of you know, mushrooms are a food product, you know, and there are many times where an oncologist will say to me, like, you know, I don't want my patient on any supplements right now. And I'm like, okay, dietary guidelines. Okay. And, you know, more than not, they're like, yeah, whatever. Cause I'm not even going to talk about diet. So you, you handle the diet, I'll handle chemo. And I'm like, awesome. So I'm like, okay, shiitake, maitake, um, lion's mane. Um, let's get into this. So I will leave, um, the herbs that require decoction extraction out reishi, chaga, cordyceps, turkey tail, those, those herbs, I mean, I guess you could chew on them, but it's really disgusting. And you know, you're, you're not going to break down the cell wall just by eating, but I've got all these other herbs, right? Even, um, you know, we can, the, I, we talked about this before those little, those little wood ear, the tremola drinks, you know, in the Korean grocery stores, um, you can even drink those, but you can, you can have shiitake, maitake, agaricus, lion's mane dietarily, you know? So even if, you can't, maybe you hate taking supplements. Maybe your doctors have said, I don't want you on supplements while you're on this other medication. You can still be looking to making mushroom broths. You can still be looking to adding, you know, cooked mushrooms in almost everything you eat. So that's like, I think that's the best advice that anybody could follow. Like, yeah, see, see your practitioners, get on a, a regimen of supplements and, and, and herbs and, and find kind of a path through all of that. But if you can't do any of that, you know, get to the grocery store. Agaricus is, you know, an incredible mushroom. Um, you know, the, the whole, uh, there's a story about a Chinese doctor going to Cuba in the sixties. Right. And he, he, all of his Cuban patients were like super healthy and he couldn't figure out why. And he found out they were all eating agaricus all the time in all of their, um, in all of their meals. So he sent the agaricus, I, th I think it was either to Japan or back to China to be studied. And that's where they found out the immune modulating capabilities of, ag of agaricus. So that's in like every grocery store in America, like it's an easy thing to find. So dietary mushrooms wherever possible. Yeah, accessible, still food, and yeah, lots of powerful nutrients and compounds. Yeah, and your doctors are usually not going to tell you like, oh, don't do this, right? Because it's just part of your diet. They're usually totally fine with it. Um, and in cases where I've had patients on chemo and radiation, um, you know, again, this is an anecdotal, it's not a research study, but in, in the cases that I've seen with cancer, um, often their side effects are much lower, you know, when taking, when, when they've got a good diet of um, medicinal mushrooms. So again, it's anecdotal. I can't publish that. It's, it's just, uh, just an observation, but you know, if that happens in more than one patient, you're kind of, if it happens in one patient, you're like, oh, well, that was really cool. That was amazing. And then it happens in a second patient. You're like, huh, this is awesome. This is working. Um, so someday I hope to be able to do a study on that and write that up. That would be an amazing study. But we do see it. There's research out there that shows these protective effects. And um, my paper talks about that. The one I just had published uh, beginning of this year in Frontiers in Pharmacology. Um, I did an overview of Chinese herbs and their effects on T cells. And, and one of the things that comes up again and again and again is the reduction of side effects from chemo and radiation. How can people find you, Rob? Your website, your contact, you want to share? Oh, um, <laughs> my website is AuthenticHealingTraditions.com. Three words, AuthenticHealingTraditions.com. Um, and I'm all over, all over Facebook and, the, you know, the interwebs. I'm on, I'm on the web. I'm on the line. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm on Facebook and, and do all that. I'm, I'm always in, uh, you know, I'm always in like mushroom social groups and Chinese medicine, social media groups and all that stuff, trying to, you know, cause good trouble and <laughs> get people on the path. All right. Well, we'll, we'll send people, we'll send, we'll put it in the show notes and send it to you. Sure. Awesome. Thank you. That would be great. Thanks again for chatting with Real Mushrooms.
No, thank you. That was fun. I appreciate it.